Every year as the high holidays approach, I hear well-meaning Jews online telling us Noahides that concepts like teshuva, atonement, and even free will don't apply to non-Jews. But is this true? Let's delve into that. Each year around this time, I see a lot of comments from well-meaning Jews online stating that concepts like teshuva and atonement either don't apply to us non-Jews or are somehow different for us than for Israelites. So how can we know whether this is true or not? To answer this question, we need to look at four major fundamental concepts. Free will, sin, reward and punishment, and teshuva or repentance. Now, as a side note, I should point out that one should always keep the question in mind, how does this apply to me as a Noahide when learning Torah? Because there's a, there's a classic principle that we don't learn Torah as some sort of intellectual exercise or even as some sort of like magical spiritual endeavor, but rather we learn in order to do. Thus, we should be learning Torah as it applies to us. So always ask this question. Does what I'm learning apply to me as a non-Jew? And if so, how? So back to the original question. Do these fundamental concepts apply to us non-Jews? And I'll answer this simply up front for those who are impatient. Yes, these concepts are the same for Jews and non-Jews. Hashem relates to all humanity in essentially the same way when it comes to these matters. And there's really no dispute among the rabbis and even learned Jews that this is the case. What throws some people off and confuses them on this question is two things. One is that the sages of Israel usually discuss these concepts as they relate to Jewish obligation, because Israelites have a mitzvah to verbally confess when making teshuvah. That's one of the 613 commandments that Jews are obligated in. And the second thing that throws people off is that the sages of Israel rarely, if ever, actually discuss whether these matters are different between Jews and non-Jews. So people assume that the sages' discussion of these matters are somehow limited to Jewish application because they're silent regarding non-Jews. But here's what they're missing. If you look at the sources that the rabbis bring forth to explain these matters from the Tanakh, there's no need to discuss this issue because it's obvious. Each of these concepts is primarily explained by looking at stories from the Tanakh that directly involve non-Jews. So it's patently obvious that these concepts apply to both Jews and non-Jews in the same way. Let me show you what I mean. We're, let's briefly look at each of these four concepts, and I'll show you some of the examples that the rabbis bring forth to explain them. Now, we're not going to go into any great depth in any of these issues. Um, we'll do that in later issues. But from this video, you should be able to see that these concepts do apply to us non-Jews. First, let's consider the topic of free will. Now, this is the idea that we human beings, unlike animals, are able to know the difference between good and evil and to freely choose our actions rather than simply following our instinctual programming. The first and most primary example of this idea comes from Adam and Eve, the first human beings. Now, you're probably familiar with this story, but let me recap. So while in the Garden of Eden, God gives them every tree in the garden to eat from, but withholds one tree, saying, this tree is not yours, don't eat of it. But of course, they chose to steal the fruit and eat it anyways. And in response to this, God says, Behold, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, which the sages explain is an acknowledgement that man has now developed free will to choose his own actions, whether good or evil. Now, the concept of free will is actually a very deep and complex issue, which brings us to our next example, which is Paro, the Pharaoh of the Exodus. So while the nation of Yisrael were slaves in Egypt, Moshe comes to Pharaoh and famously demands, let my people go, 
And of course, Pharaoh refuses and a whole chain of events unfolds, resulting ultimately in the exodus from Egypt. But as part of this process, Pharaoh ends up losing his free will. As it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, this is a very deep, complex issue, which I'm not going to go into here, but the sages discuss this idea and its implications at great length. And this story of, of Paro, of Pharaoh in Egypt, is the main example they use when discussing whether a person can actually be so evil that they lose their free will. So we see here the example of two sets of non-Jews, Adam and Eve and Pharaoh who are brought forth by the sages of Israel to explain how free will works. Based on these examples, do you think the concept of free will applies to non-Jews? So now, what about the concept of sin? When we human beings use our free will to do evil rather than good, this is what we refer to as sin. Now, technically in Hebrew, there are several different words that we usually translate as sin, and each denote differences like there's unintentional sin, intentional sin, outright rebellion against God, and, and so forth. But that's really a, a lengthy discussion for another time. The first example of sin that we have, again, comes from Adam and Hawa, Adam and Eve, and the theft of the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, there's an important principle in Torah that the first time a concept is mentioned in the Torah, that passage contains the entirety of the concept. So when the sages of Israel discuss sin in particular, the story of Adam and Hawa, which is the first mention of sin in the Torah, is always picked apart and analyzed intensively. Now, the next most obvious example we have is Qayyan and Hevel or Cain and Abel. And as the story goes, Cain and his brother Abel were having difficulties, to put it mildly, and as part of their ongoing dispute, Cain ends up murdering Abel. But just prior to this, God gives Cain a warning, which the sages point out is a warning to all of us. As it says, if you do not improve yourself, sin crouches at the door. Its desire is towards you, but you can conquer it. And this teaches us the principle that we always have the ability to overcome our desires to sin and instead choose to do good. So again, we see here the example of two sets of non-Jews, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, that are brought forth by the sages of Yisrael to explain how sin works. Based on these examples, do you think the concept of sin applies to non-Jews? This brings us to the concept of reward and punishment. Now, this is the fundamental idea that God rewards us for our good deeds and punishes us for our wicked deeds. And again, these are extremely, extremely deep concepts which are very complex. Now, the most basic example of this is when Adam and Hawa, Adam and Eve, sin by stealing and eating from the fruit of the tree and are punished by being exiled from the Garden of Eden. A far more complex and nuanced treatment of these concepts is found in Sefer Iyov, or the Book of Job. Now, the Book of Job centers around a non-Jewish man named Iyov, or Job, who experiences the sudden and devastating loss of everything he owns, his property, his home, his land, his wife, all of his children, and even his own health. And as he sits in the dust and ashes, covered in boils and disease, his non-Jewish friends come to comfort him. And together they all discuss these concepts of divine justice and reward and punishment at great length. And the sages of Israel derive many fundamental concepts from these philosophical and theological discussions being held by this group of non-Jews. So once again, we see here the example of two sets of non-Jews, Adam and Eve and Eov and his friends that are brought forth by the sages of Israel to explain how reward and punishment works. So based on these examples, what do you think? Do this, does this concept of reward and punishment apply to non-Jews or not? Finally, let's examine the last concept, 
teshuva or repentance. Now, teshuva is the idea that when we have sinned, we can turn away from our evil deeds and return to God, and he will forgive us. Now, not to beat a dead horse, but again, the first example of teshuva in the Torah is Adam and Hawa. And after sinning by stealing and eating the fruit of the tree, the sages point out that Adam and Eve then go through the standard process of teshuva, feeling remorse for their sins and having the opportunity to confess their sins to God. Now, the best example of teshuva is found in the book traditionally read on the holiday of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And this is the day on which the entire Jewish people come together to collectively repent of their sins. And what is the book that they read to inspire themselves to repentance and remind themselves of the power of teshuva? Sefer Yonah, the book of Jonah. And of course, the central story of Sefer Yonah is of the Jewish prophet Jonah, who is sent to the all-Gentile city of Nineveh, capital of the Gentile Assyrian Empire, to tell them that they will be destroyed for their wickedness. And of course, the people of Nineveh heed the prophet's warning and make teshuva and repent of their wicked ways. And Hashem forgives them. And this an example of non-Jews repenting and being forgiven is what the Jewish people read about on Yom Kippur to remind themselves that nothing can stand in the way of teshuva. So again, we see here the example of two sets of non-Jews, Adam and Eve and the city of Nineveh that are brought forth by the sages of Israel to explain how teshuva works. So based on these examples, do you think the concept of teshuva applies to non-Jews? So now that we've gone through each of these four major concepts, let's revisit our original question. Do the ideas of free will, sin, reward and punishment, and teshuva apply equally to Jews and non-Jews, or are they different? As should be blatantly obvious from each of the examples we just went through, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Paro, Iov and his friends, and the city of Nineveh in the book of Yonah, examples that the sages of Yisrael themselves use to explain these major concepts, the answer is clearly yes. These concepts apply equally to both Jews and non-Jews. So the next time someone tries to tell you that these concepts are different for Jews and non-Jews, simply point them to these examples and tell them that the sages of Yisrael and the Tanakh disagree. If you want to learn more about these concepts and how they relate to us Noahides, a wonderful starting point is Rabbi Baron's book, Guide for the Noahide, which has an excellent chapter on the topic of Teshuvah. And if you want to delve deeper into these ideas, I would highly recommend reading a section of Rambam's Mishnah Torah called Hilachoth Teshuvah, or the Laws of Repentance, in which he explains in very clear and simple language the mitzvah of Teshuvah and all of these fundamental principles we just talked about. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed this discussion, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. And feel free to leave your questions and comments in the comment section below. Also, visit our website at beingnoahide.com to read some more of our articles.